uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining our webinar uh, for October. Uh, sorry, there was no no webinar last month. Uh, I had a second baby and it was a very busy time for us, but now excited. And the reason I also mention it is that if you hear a baby crying in the background, that's that's a four week old, that's not happy. Um, I wanna, I'm very excited to welcome my co-host today, Jonathan Sue from Tribe Capital. Uh, him and I have been chatting over the last uh, several months at this point on a lot of his perspective on some of these metrics that he looks at uh, when investing in companies. And I have been a big fan, obviously at Retina, we do a lot of customer lifetime value work, but it, it's very closely related to a lot of the metrics we're gonna talk about today. Um, so it's, it's gonna be super exciting. Uh, welcome, Jonathan. And first, let me give you give a quick introduction about you, and I'd love to then have you give a quick intro about Tribe Capital as well, and then I can do a quick intro, and then uh, we can get started. Uh, but Jonathan is a founding uh, general partner at Tribe Capital, where he works on recognizing and amplifying product market fit in the context of venture capital. Uh, prior to this, he was a partner at Social Capital. Where he, where he led the data science efforts and explored the relationship between data and venture capital. Before that, Jonathan was at Facebook for several, year, several years where he helped form and lead the data science and analytics organizations for Facebook overall. And from, my, from what I remember our conversation, you were a part of the growth team at some point, right, Jonathan? Some, yes, for part of that. Yeah, I think that, and for those of you who may or may not know that, that's probably, that's one of the most like coveted teams to work at inside Facebook and that did a lot of really foundational work on growing the business and in the early years of the company. Um, and then uh, prior to that, Jonathan holds a degree, holds a PhD in theoretical physics from Stanford University and did his undergraduate studies in physics and math from UC Berkeley. Um, he has uh, also led data at social gaming company called slide which was max levchin's company which i think i'd love for you uh, jonathan to give a little bit more background on and uh, he it was uh, via a small acquisition of a social gaming company that he had co-founded after spending some time at microsoft um and then you guys know me um you know uh, i i run a company called retina ai that focuses on early customer lifetime value and as far as we know we are the only company right now that tries to estimate customer lifetime value at or before the point of first transaction with the idea of optimizing marketing budgets for at the, at the individual customer level. And prior to this, I spent um, my time uh, at a couple of years at Facebook and then at PayPal running merchant analytics. Uh, and before that, most of my time was spent being a nerdy engineer, building autopilots for helicopters and satellites. Um, and prior to that, uh, I have a back background in electrical engineering. Before we start, Jonathan, I want to welcome you and give you some, uh, have you give the audience a little bit about uh, your background and more importantly, tell us, you know, what, what's Tribe Capital? Uh, how is it different from other venture capital firms? Yeah, sure thing. Um, well, I think you gave, you gave most of the story there, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess a Tribe you know, Tribe, we're, as, as you mentioned, you know, we're an early stage venture firm located in San Francisco. There are three of us founding partners. Um, you know, we've been around for a couple of years now. The, the focus at Tribe is really all around, um, you know, recognizing early stage product market fit and using that as a way to help us sort of understand the world and be a great partner for early stage founders, um, you know, so that we can help them build big, great businesses. You know, we, we're strong believers that uh, product market fit and expanding it which is, you know, it used to be called growth, but now, now we kind of just call it product market fit. You know, this concept is really instrumental for early stage companies to reach the next scale, the scale of their evolution. And so we really focus on sort of articulating that, measuring it and providing that value back to founders, um, you know, whether we're investing or not. And that's, that's really the core thing. Um, and then, you know, um, you know as, as sort of Imad had mentioned, you know, the, the history of this stuff um, in terms of using data to measure this stuff, really, you know, my career has spanned a lot of that. You know, as you mentioned, you know, I'd, I'd started um, the part, part of my career in the you know, 2006 in the social gaming era. Um, in, back in those days was sort of the early days when sort of data, um, you know, was all of a sudden usable in some sense. Um, you know, I guess, you know, we talk about sort of the history here, um, you know, prior to about 2005, 2006, it wasn't really possible to measure this stuff. 
because nobody had the data, right? It was too expensive right. to store the data. And then right around um, in the mid 2000s, all of a sudden it became really cheap to store a lot of data and really cheap to compute on it. By compute, I didn't even count. You know, prior to that era, it was very difficult to like count unique up to a billion. That was actually a hard problem because like uh, the machines at the time couldn't handle that. And sort of a bunch of advancements in distributed computing and, and um, you know, uh, storage that made that possible. All of a sudden, all these companies had a ton of data. And so naturally what they did was there's like two branches, right? One branch is let's build some amazing products to leverage this. Let's build search as a product. That's, a, that's an example right. of a product that needs a lot of data that would be technologically infeasible prior to, you know, sort of the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, let's build recommendation engines. Let's build these products. That's one branch of thinking. There's a whole other branch of thinking, which is, okay, we have all this data. How do we make strategic decisions? How do we decide what product to build? How do we decide how to, you know, uh, deploy capital? How do we, how do we, you know, address this question about should I buy this company or not? Corporate development problem. And can we, can we address those questions in a different way using all this data? In some sense, you know, um, all of these companies were sort of exploring that in parallel. Um, at Facebook, at, you know, at Google, Twitter, Amazon, all of these companies in the mid to 2000s were sort of exploring this in parallel. And um, you know, I was part of that at Facebook, exploring that um, you know, within the context of the problems that we were facing there. And in some sense, you know, a lot of what we've done now, try to sort of continue that evolution of thinking, but specifically into the line of how do we um, use that to be you know, great venture investors? How do we use that to help, help founders on their journey? Yeah, um, and I'm excited to talk about this because I also uh, had a different way that I came at it. And before we get started, maybe let's set up some logistics. Uh, and I've done this each of the webinars where I wanna make sure that this is a really good learning opportunity for the folks who are attending. We're gonna cover some really interesting concepts around growth accounting, cohort LTV and sales concentration. Uh, what I'd like to maybe get started with is how how this got started so before any, anything maybe we'll cover the history of accounting and analytics from your perspective jonathan you wrote, you've written a really wonderful article on this on the tribe capital essay but i've also seen your essays from social capital which are really good which are a series of essays that talk about some of these different metrics that you're looking at and uh, just to give you some context like how i got started when i switched over my career from working on control law design and uh, looking at aer aerospace stuff to the analytics world. One of the books I came across when I was doing merchant analytics at PayPal was a very uh, simple but like elegant book called Lean Analytics that talked a lot about some of these basic metrics around cohort retention curves, which are, you know, some people have been calling them triangle charts and there's various names for it uh, that, that I've seen, but there, there are some really interesting analytics there. And we started saying, hey, how can we expand these merchant analytics to all merchants that PayPal had? And then uh, when I moved over to Facebook, I got an introduction to a new concept, which was growth accounting, which I thought was super fascinating. And um, you know what, what I'd love to kind of hear from your perspective, you, you've seen the story from like all the way back in like early 2000s. So uh, maybe we'll start off with that. And then I wanna make sure we go into these uh, different charts. But what we've done for today is we've taken a sample company and their analytics, and we're gonna walk through each one of those charts. Uh, in terms of logistics, one thing I'd like to do for the audience is we would love for you guys to be involved and ask, ask questions at any point. Both Jonathan and I can see your questions and comments in the chat window, and we'll try to address them throughout the presentation. Uh, and if it gets too uh, monotonous, I might start picking on people. So I want to keep it as like college style as possible. Uh, so let's 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 make sure we do the Q and A and keep it uh, to a very engaging level. Uh, with that, let's get started. Maybe the first uh, first thing we'll start with is history of accounting and analytics. Uh, and Jonathan, I'll I'll give the floor to you, and maybe you can talk about this and how this came about. From like, if you think about early days back in the 1940s to like where accounting is and how we're thinking about data science. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you allude to a little bit, but I, I think you know when I think about the history here, you know, people think about analytics and data science as being like a new thing that just happened that, oh, you know, this is a thing that only happened in the last 10, 20 years. It's really not, you know, and, and I think, you know, part of part of my mission has been to sort of tell this story and to, and to give people that perspective, you know, um, you know, the original version of data science is really accounting. You know, if you, if you go back, like, what does an accountant do? Um, you know, accountant takes a pile of raw data, which is like the ledger, right, every transaction, and they turn it into something useful. 
like an income statement or a balance sheet. Now, you know, you know, data scientists, that's all they do. They work in raw data, they take a raw data set and they turn it into something useful. Maybe they do fancy math, predictive, ML, whatever, you know, AI. But in the end of the day, if you're kind of a strategic decision maker, all of that doesn't matter too much. At the end of the day, you want to know, is it useful and can I trust it? That's really what you're focused on. Um, so, so, so when I think about, you know, how we use data in the business, really, you know, I think of accounting as sort of the first, you know, example of where that happened. If you dig into the history of how accounting works inside of a business, right, um, if you, you know, it was really invented sort of in the, you know, 15, 1600s, and the context is more like, okay, you know, um, I have a ship, you know, I'm, I run a shipping business or something, or I'm selling widgets or something, how do I just keep track of who's paying me, you know, who do I owe money to, can I keep track of that as I run my business? And so you develop this concept of like double entry bookkeeping and you develop, you develop these ideas, but they're all in the context of, um, of running a business, right? They're not in the context of investing in a business. Indeed, you know, when you sort of talk about the early days of, um, you know, sort of the, the stock market, um, you know, sort of in the 1800s and the early 1900s, investing behavior in those days was really entirely speculation based. It was kind of FOMO and speculation. People were just like, oh, I heard a rumor that those people are buying, I'm just going to buy. And really, you know, um, there was this guy, Benjamin Graham, who is actually really famous as being sort of the father of value investing, of fundamental investing. And really what he did, right, at some level was um, that he had a view on how value is created. He said, oh, I believe that a company is valuable if its book value is, you know, below what I pay, is above what I pay for it. If I can buy it, um, you know, uh, if I can buy it for um, less than book value. And so, and in particular, that I can recognize that value in accounting. And so Benjamin Graham was unique in that he was, he, was, he was the first person to think I can use accounting as an investor because accounting will provide a model for how I think about value. And that was really novel at the time. Nowadays, that's like not novel, right? Nowadays, it's like, of course, you look at financial statements when you invest. But that was like not, not obvious 100 years ago. Um, and so he was the first person to do that. So a lot of, you know, when we think about what we're doing at Tribe, what we think about analytics is along those same, that same line, right? Um, you know, just like the beginning of accounting, the early accounting was really used to run a business. And we think about this big data explosion that I described earlier in the mid 2000s, the first place where it was being used was in companies who were trying to, you know, make improvements as Facebook is trying to grow, as Google is trying to do whatever, you know, as businesses are trying to do what they do, right? Um, and that was the first place where it was used. And a lot of what we're doing at Tribe is really trying to go to that next level of like, okay, how do we use it as external investors? Is there a way for us to add value? So that's that's kind of that's kind of the, the arc of history. So when I think about you know the, the similarity between product analytics and uh, and accounting, you know, right here here are some you know features of accounting that I think are really interesting. If you think about accounting, accounting is interesting because it is an analytical framework that applies to all businesses, right? Um, whether you're an insurance business, whether you're a restaurant, you know whether you sell widgets, you have an income statement. That's pretty amazing, right? Um, if you think about it, when people talk about product analytics, you know, many of you probably work in companies where you're doing analytics, you think, oh, there's some analytics that's very specific for my company because my company is unique, it's a snowflake, so such and such. Um, you know, but somehow you can treat, you know, if, if, if we have a framework, you know, like accounting that can apply everywhere, shouldn't we have a framework that can apply everywhere for, you know, non-financial metrics? That's, that's kind of amazing, right? Um, that's one feature that's really interesting. Another feature is this feature of where even though it's broad, it can become very specific and detailed in specific sectors. For instance, you know, if you look, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at income statements of an insurance company before. Insurance companies have really specific income statements. They're kind of laid out a certain way. Their balance sheets are laid out a certain way. So even though the concepts of accounting are really broad, there are sort of specifics that end up, you know, people have worked out in different sectors. Um, and so when I think about sort of, you know, frameworks for product analytics and sort of this framework we're talking about today, a tribe, we call it the eight ball, you know, there's sort of, you know, it, it has many incarnations around the ecosystem. You know, that's kind of what we think about is what, you know, does it have these, these features of being universal, simple, if you, that you can apply it everywhere, but then it, it can sort of help you get really specific um, into whatever specific problem you're looking at. What I liked about this framework that you've laid out here is the part that it is applicable to almost any business and it goes beyond what the financial statements have done in the past. You're looking at the customer behavior and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what I wanted to ask you about is what, what is it when, when you're looking at it from an investor perspective versus an operator perspective, like what makes that differentiation? And another thing I found here was that you stay away from anything predictive. You're looking at 
mostly historical stuff and simple to calculate. Like you're not, there's, there, you're removing ambiguity of like what assumptions might be made to get to some sort of a prediction and you don't, you might not know about, know much about that. Can you talk a little bit about that of like investor versus operator hat and then what, you know, what's the, uh, what's the logic behind keeping it to only historical or predict, you yeah. know, some might say that, hey, look, predictive gives you some value forward looking. Sure. You know, I mean, so the, the job of the investor and the operator are fundamentally different, right? The, the mm -hmm. operator is like, I am running this business. How do I make it better? The, uh, right. the investor is like, I have a choice whether or not I want to be involved in this business, right? Most of the time, presumably, I'm not going to be involved. And so I'm, I'm making a different set of decisions, right? Now, of course, once an investor is in a business, you know, in particular in venture capital, where you can't really get out of the business so easily, um, you know, you're in there. And so you end up, you know, your, your incentives, uh, your, your goals, objectives end up being really closely aligned. But it's important to recognize that those are different things, right? So in particular, you know, as an investor, um, you know, you're, you're not so much worried, or rather as an operator, usually you're thinking of like, okay, I've built the product. How do I make it better? What are the things I can do? Right. Whereas as an investor, it's like, if does it, you know, do I even want to be involved in this? If I don't want to be involved in it, then it doesn't matter to me how it can get better or not at some level. Right. right. Um, right. And so, and so it's sort of a different problem set that you're dealing with. Right. Um, now, of course, there's, you know, it's kind of, it's the same with accounting, right? If you, you know, when you look at finance orgs inside companies, most of what finance orgs and companies are doing is they're looking at like, you know, trying to understand the cost structure of some organization and trying to figure out, okay, like, what are we going to do? Where are we going to spend money, make investments, make more hiring, less hiring, you know, make capital investments, you know, not make capital investments to make the business better. And the finance organization is doing that with the lens of improving the business. But, you know, an external investor, an external buyer would look at the finances of the company from a different lens. They're more thinking like, do I want to buy this thing and own it, you know, in some yep. sort of, you know, in some sort of time frame. So those are the primary differences. Um, you know, in, view, in, in viewpoint that, that I think about, um, but it doesn't, but it doesn't change the underlying concept that accounting itself is the same, whether you use it for A or B. And in the same way, yeah. when I think about these frameworks that we're talking about here from an analytical point of view, um, it's the same, you know, and then you can use it to different ends, right? Um, you know, when you talk about the predictive question, you know, I, I think that's, that's part of the one, one other, another one of these aspects of accounting that's really interesting. You know, people never say, you don't say, you know, are income statements predictive? How good is the model of income statements? No, no, right. no, that's not the point of income statements. <laughs> the point of an income statement is that it tells you about the past in a bunch of variables that are well-defined. That's actually the point, right? So that you can have an intelligible conversation to like look at this business and look at another business. That's the point yeah. of accounting exactly. is to provide like well-defined quantities. And in the same way, when I think about sort of, you know, these types of topics, these analytical questions, you know, product analytics, sort of analytics that, you know, um, data, modern data science and analytics, a lot of the value is actually in just like making some well-defined quantities so that we can talk about stuff sensibly. And then prediction is a separate problem. You know, it's a problem in its own right. It's an important problem. But in many ways, the value of data shows itself more in just like transparency than it is in prediction per se. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, I don't see any questions. I think uh, it's a good time to start diving into the actual nuts and bolts of these, this framework, the, the framework, as well as some of the charts and graphs. Uh, one shout out I wanted to give is that these charts and graphs, I love the fact that you've written, not only written the full essay on it, but also you've included links to code on GitHub, where if a company wants to do this on their own, they could do it. Um, I also want to give a shout out to another a uh, fr mutual friend of our, ours, uh, Mike from Second Measure, who introduced us. Second Measure is a really cool company because they use credit card panel data and a lot of the charts we're gonna talk about, they basically provide it for any company that shows up on a credit card statement and you can get a, get a sense of where that company is. And then we obviously do it for our clients to help them understand where their business is before we start working with them on customer lifetime value-based optimizations. Uh, but let's jump in. Uh, what yeah. we've done is we've, picked a uh, company, anonymized their data and changed the numbers slightly to keep their identity hidden, but still show you what those charts and concepts look like. So let me start with um, with growth accounting. Before we like dive into the charts, uh, Jonathan, do you wanna describe this a little bit? And I'm happy to like yeah. pull up the equation if you think that's a little bit better to start place to start with. Sure, so, you know, I guess, you know, we're gonna jump into an example here. Um, and before we jump into the example, it's important to know, you know, um, Remember, when we think about accounting. Accounting is kind of built on a couple of, you know, sort of statements they call them. But you can think of them as standard analyses. There's an income statement. 
there's a balance sheet and there's a statement of cash flows. Those are sort of the three sort of pillars of accounting. Um, and in a similar way, when we think about analytics and we think about you know, understanding product market fit, there are kind of three pillars that we look at um, that have sort of, I would say many companies have sort of landed at the same spot in terms of these being approximately what to look at. And a lot of what we've done here is to sort of like articulate it clearly. Um, the first piece is this concept of growth accounting that we'll talk about. There'll be a second piece around cohorts that we'll talk about afterwards and then a third piece around concentration. Okay. Um, so in this particular case of growth accounting, the concept is, okay, you know, whenever you see something grow, when, let's, say, let's say we talk about customers. You have, you know, some number of customers and then some number of, a higher number of customers the following month, let's say. Um, the question here is, you know, there are many ways that you can go from here to here. You can just add users or you can churn a bunch of users and add a bunch more users. And those are different, right? And there are different patterns of how these things can show up. And so the idea behind growth accounting is to basically say, okay, there is, grow there, there is some growth. How do we account for it? The actual intellectual roots of this stuff come from like macroeconomics. If you look like, you know, economists were, were worried about this question of, okay, when GDP grows, how do I account for the growth of GDP? Was it due to exports? Was it due to, you know, productivity gains? Was it due to, I don't know, something else? And how do you account for how the growth occurred? And here we're looking at a much smaller problem, of course, this is the problem of just how is, you know, the number of customers growing or the amount of revenue growing, but at some level you're trying to do the same thing. And so what this graph here shows is, remember I said that when it goes from here to here, you know, it can lose some and it can gain some. And so the loss and the gain, what we're doing is we're taking those out each month and we're just showing those. And so the blue right. stuff above is the growth piece and the green stuff below is whatever was lost. And presumably the net growth is the stuff above the line, you know, minus the stuff below the line. Okay, that's the net growth. Right. And so in this particular example here, we see some company that, you know, in the past, so, so you know, an interpretation of this one here, they're kind of, first of all, look to the left, you know, basically um, before March, 2020, you can see at that point back in, the, in that era, they would gain some and lose some every month, but they were about the same. And so the company wasn't really growing, right? That's kind of what that era is. And then what happens here is starting around March, 2020, um, you see that all of a sudden there's growth, right? There's more stuff on top than stuff on the bottom. So it's growing. And then it appears that, you know, around June, July, you know, um, whatever happened, that growth has, st has stopped and now more of the churn is coming off the bottom. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking at here. That's what this is showing. So one thing that I wanted to ask you, Jonathan, about this, so I love this concept of growth accounting because it really helps us understand the, this growth, the concept of like the components of growth. How, how have you thought about picking what period? So here, we're actually not looking at monthly, we're looking at a 90 day interval. And okay. this is because this business has a repeat purchase that's different from a other another business. Um, how do you, how do, how have you thought about, uh, should it be on a monthly level? Should it be on a quarterly daily and what types of businesses have you seen use different periods? Yeah. I mean, there's no right answer here. You know, like you can, it all works, you know, going back to the accounting, you can use, you can do income statements on a monthly quarterly annual basis, whatever you want. It's more a question of like, what's useful to you for the job you're doing. Um, you know, typically, you know, for us as investors, we tend to look monthly because usually we're seeing businesses that are 24, you know, any somewhere between six to 24 months old is when we're looking at them as venture investors. Um, if you're like a public investor and you're looking at companies that are many years old, maybe you're looking at quarters, right? If you're building the product and you really think that there's an engagement cycle that happens every week, you know, and you're really sort of focused in, then maybe it makes sense to look on a weekly basis. But it really depends sort of on the underlying sort of objective and the underlying behavior that you're trying to um, sort of bring to life with the, with, with the analysis. If a company came to you and said, hey, look, look at our growth accounting charts. We are showing a lot of growth in the last five months and they're using, let's say a six month window, right? They're obviously like missing the point because you can put in a lot of new customers in a six month window and they're just gonna show up as new customers for like at least a rolling six month window, right? So what are the advantages and disadvantages of like, how, how would you like react to that? You would obviously like say, hey, look, obviously you're picking the wrong window to, look at this, but like, what, how does that come up? Well, usually I try to be more diplomatic. I would say, good job, <laughs> well done, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you know, but you're right. I think you can never, you can't really get the full picture, right? Um, you know, by looking at only one or two things. I think that's, you know, those of us, you know, everybody on this call is probably like, you know, analytically minded in some sense, we all have some sort of data science analytics bent. And so invariably we want to see more, right? Like one or two numbers yeah. is not going to make us feel confident that a, that a phenomenon is occurring. <laughs> 
What about adding revenue to this? So I don't have a slide for that, but I wanted to pull up the the uh, image you have on your article, um, which if you did, so we're doing this for customers today in this chart, but if you did it, did this for revenue, we can add two more components. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about expansion and resurrect, uh, expansion and um, resurrect, uh, uh, yeah. contractions. Yeah, we didn't talk about this earlier, but when we talk about product market fit, in particular, when I think about the concept of product market fit, a lot of the value in having a framework around it is being able to address non revenue oriented quantities, right? So remember income statements, they really only deal with like dollars, right? Or recurrence of money, right? Um, whereas, you know, when we think about product market fit, we usually think about it as possibly applying to things other than money, right? Like, uh, you know, Facebook has a bunch of users using it. That's product market fit, regardless of whether or not there's money changing hands, right? Um, and so, you know, I think one of the, this is sort of, I think one of the things that's really amazing about this era of data is that we can treat non-monetary quantities you know, with some level of rigor. Um, and so, you know, you know, as sort of we alluded to earlier, a lot of what was figured out at Facebook, they were kind of early in this. They, they built a bunch of system, you know, frameworks to think about sort of, you know, engagement growth in a systematic way that, that looked like accounting. You know, but you can go back to, you know, at some level, really what's going on is anytime there's a product and there's a customer engaging, right? And there's an exchange of value, whether it's money or not, right? You can sort of measure that and account for it. In this particular case, when there's money involved, right? There's this concept that revenue can go up and the revenue can go up from new or it can, you know, a new customer, or it can be a customer spending more money, expanding their revenue, right? Similarly, when money leaves the system, it can be a customer churning or it can just be a customer spending less. So there's this concept of contraction. Okay. So, so when we think about this for like revenue quantities or things like that, you know, there's sort of this expansion contraction concept. When you look at users, when you think about just an active user, an active user is either active or not. There's no sense of you know, expanding or contracting yeah. active. And so that's why you tend not to see that. That said, there are ways to treat engagements that have expansion and contraction um, that, that will handle that. And you can, you can similarly treat, for instance, like number of days active as being some sort of numerical quantity or maybe time spent or something like that. Yeah. 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 I think uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about this was uh, actually uh, there's a question that somebody asked. Is there a certain point at which we can think of growth as having arrived at a product market fit? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, so when, when we use the term product market fit, I actually tend to use it like the term profitable. OK, so people think that they know what profitable means. But actually, in accounting, there is no concept of profitable like there is gross margin profitable, net profitable, EBITDA profitable, unit profitable, contribution margin profitable. There's many, so profitable really is like a collection of measurable concepts. That's how I think about it. And so when I think about product market fit, that's how I think of it. I think of it as a collection of measurable concepts, like profitable as a collection, right? So like, do you have product market fit? Well, it depends on the specific definition you're using, you know, but just like, you know, having a quantitative approach to accounting helps you helps you define a whole family of de definitions and profitability. You know, I believe that having these quantitative frameworks here will help us arrive at a bunch of quantitative definitions of product market fit. What um, would be a red flag here? Like if you saw a red flag, you say, hey, look, I don't think this company has, has meets the growth accounting product market fit um, criteria. Well, I, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of what you look at here is sort of the nature, you know, is it churning, right? So the question is yeah. like, you know, I guess, you know, when I, when I usually look at these graphs, I think of it as like, um, you know, when you see a company that's growing, okay, it's growing. Now there are many different ways that it's growing. Are you growing by just adding or are you growing by churning a ton and adding a ton? Or is it highly yeah. varied? And really the goal yeah. is just articulate it, you know, and I don't want to yeah. say it has probably market fit or not. It's more like, just like, what is it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and then can yeah. we have a discussion around what it is, you know? Um, it's less about good or bad, but more like having a concrete understanding of what it is and then using that concrete understanding to help you drive whatever decision you're making, whether the decision is some feature or if the decision is some investment decision. Yeah, and, uh, and, and let's move on to the next con topic related to growth accounting, which is ratios. But I wanna make sure I ask this question to the audience. What do you think might be going on starting in March of 2020 and um, what, what, what might have happened in June? Um, Another question that just got asked is, when do you layer in cost drivers of growing? Yeah, fantastic question. Yeah, um, this is a really good question, actually. So, so um, if any of you have actually read my articles or have thought about this stuff, like um, 
a lot of it really only um, focuses on above the line at some level. What I mean is that when people think of accounting statement, they think revenue and then costs, okay? In some sense, when we talk about product market fit, we're talking about pre-revenue, engagement, right? Because presumably engagement produces revenue and then there are costs, right? And that's how an income statement is roughly laid out. So a lot of the stuff we're looking at here is pre-income statement, right? It's, it's product market fit. Um, and you're right that like, you know, so, so step one in some sense is really measuring this systematically. There's no costs. And then you can address this. Once you have a systematic understanding of that, you can then add in costs. We tend to think of that, you know, at least for me, I tend to think of it as a separate question. I think of product market fit as a separate question from whether or not a company can achieve the product market fit while retaining a profit, right? There's a sort of thought exercise you can have here. Imagine the following product. Here's a product. There's a box that sits on the corner and it says, um, if you put 50 cents inside the box, it will give you a dollar. That's an amazing product. I bet that yeah. product would have product market fit in the sense that like people would come and use it, but clearly yeah. it would not be able to do so while generating profit, right? That's an example yeah. where like, it's not profitable product market fit. But I think about the profitability in some sense as separate from the ability to generate product market fit in particular because the definition of product market fit that we've been talking about is applicable to non-money, right? Like it's just revenue, right? Like, uh, or not revenue, it's just engagement. Engagement, right? yeah. It's, it's usage or something like that. And what is the cost? Well, the cost is somewhere else. and it, and that's not, it's not the right thing to put it in directly into the anal analysis at that point. Yeah, and we talked about this in our BCG uh, webinar we did last time. And one interesting example of this is streaming wars that are going on right now. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a pure um, effort to try to gain market share. And there are probably a lot of these types of boxes where you're just like getting a lot of like good in content <laughs> you're getting access to today. Yes. Purely in the, in the, um, in, with the intent of gaining customers and engagement. Well, there right, is actually let's quickly chat. There is actually, just keep in mind, there is cost there. So, so what you're basically saying is that you effectively get a dollar worth of value out of Netflix by only paying it 50 cents. It's true, right? But it's coming from somewhere. And where it's coming from mm -hmm. is actually in the capital markets, right? Because the capital markets yes. are saying, oh, I will fund your unprofitable growth. And they put money in it. And that money right. actually comes from you somehow, right? Because it's, usually it's money being created somewhere. <laughs> right at the expense of the money that you have in your pocket. So the cost is yeah. coming sort of at the system level. That's a that's right. another that's another discussion. At the, the other macro <laughs> macroeconomic level discussion there. All right, let's quickly chat about these ratios. So um, what I was really interested in is quickly looking at the, what growth accounting enables us to do is compute some basic ratios and you know the the ratio definitions are here. But I want I think what would be really interesting to hear is what's good, what's bad. So Gross retention is just period over period uh, re re retention. Uh, and it seems like this just should be greater than one. Does that sound right, Jonathan? Probably good. Good. <laughs> or, Quick or ratio. Not, is, not greater than one, not greater than one, but not super high, right? You don't want to you don't want to yeah. lose everybody. <laughs> right. Right. And then quick ratio is how much new uh, either customers or, or, or revenue you had versus churn. And this, you obviously want to be well north of one. And you mentioned that you've seen this to be much higher than one for SaaS companies and maybe for other retail or e-com companies might be better to just be above one. Yeah, you know, I think about these metrics as being sort of like, um, you know, when you look at the full growth accounting, there are some sort of things that come out of it. It's kind of like if you look at an income statement, you can compute you know, sort of gross margin as a ratio that comes out of the income statement, right? In a similar way here, that's kind of what this stuff is. Um, in particular, you know, with quick ratio, it's kind of the above the line, you know, divided by the below the line stuff. Um, and, you know, you know, I guess when I look at this, you know, usually in consumer companies generating transactional revenue, this tends to be around one or just north of one. In B2B SaaS companies, it can be extremely high. The reason why is because the churn fees can be very low, you know, I mean, like, you know, as you probably know, yeah. as some of you probably know, depending on, you know, there are certain business models that just generate very low churn, not just business models. Yeah. Business Slack, models. Slack is an example, right? Like Slack's a well, perfect example of this. Yeah, maybe. So like, um, you know, they have churn, <laughs> you know, but, but what yeah, I mean is true. situations where like, you know, you sign a few customers and they literally never, ever churn, right? Um, right. You know, um, and, and so, and so if there's zero, if there's very little churn, this ratio can obviously get very high, at which point it starts becoming not really super meaningful. Right, I mean, that, that's kind of how I think of that one. Um, net churn down here is a common one in the SaaS world. Um, so the way to think about net churn is that um, growth, um, this is actually like an accounting identity, it's in my article. Um, growth is actually just 
it only comes from new, new customers or it comes from existing customers. And the existing customers, all of that existing customers, we call it, it's like net churn, right? It's effectively, the idea is I add a bunch of customers and then all of the existing customers net out to produce some churn. And that netting out sometimes produces growth. Usually it produces churn, but every now and then there is negative net churn, in which case it produces mm -hmm. growth. And that's sort of a special situation. Um, you know, sort of good B2B SaaS companies pretty much all have this. It's negative net churn yeah. in some fashion, um, somewhere between a little bit to a lot of negative net churn. That's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty normal. If you guys read sort of, if you go around, like a lot of people have written about SaaS metrics, and this is one that yeah. shows up a lot. Part of, I think, you know, what we're doing here is pointing out that the concept of net, net churn actually falls out of growth accounting. It's not just some mm -hmm. that, that exists in isolation. It exists within a broader framework. Yeah, this comes up. I've, I've I've been to the Saster conference a couple of times, and this is a, one of the biggest metrics pretty much every company there talks about. All right, um, are, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to share them, and we'll move on to the next topic. I'm also trying to keep track of time. We're definitely going over time, but we'll we'll try to keep rolling through these. Uh, so this is the cohort historical LTV or LTV chart and really revenue, I should say, because we're not looking at the cost in this case. Um, what are we looking at here, Jonathan? Well, this is the cumulative lifetime revenue generated per customer for each cohort, right? And so when, I, when we look at something like this, there's a few things to take away, right? There's, there's the shape, there's, uh, you know, the, where it's actually going, the level, right? The level itself. And then there's difference between cohorts, any trend. Those are usually the three sort of things you're looking at here. In this particular case, the shape is clearly sublinear. Sometimes it's like bent like that, but yeah. in this case, they're kind of bent down, okay? So the shape is sublinear, which is to say you make less money from them in the future than you do at the beginning. Not too surprising, that's the way most businesses are. Um, you know, in terms of the actual level, well, it tells you right there, you know, the LTV after whatever, six months, is this months or years? Years. Years, um, this is years. LTV yeah. after three years, after three years is whatever. Uh, it's somewhere between 130 to $180. You can see there's some yeah. spread, you know, one thing you can think about a lot here is whether there's a lot of spread or a little spread. You know, some some businesses have very tight um, LTV. For instance, Netflix, everybody pays the same. Yeah. So the LTVs yeah. are pretty tight. Whereas like, you know, Amazon, well, there's probably some people who spend a ton and then some people who spend less. You know, it wouldn't be surprising if there was a bit more uh, a bit more width in those LTV curves. Um, what would I say, the last thing? Oh yeah, the last thing is about trends. So of course the shorter lines are, um, are uh, more recent, recent or they're younger, yeah. right? Um, and the longer ones are older cohorts. And so, you know, in this particular case, it appears to be getting somewhat better over time. This visualization is not very good at demonstrating the trend because um, they get mushed together. Um, the heat map tends to be better for the trend, but this one is better for the shape. One thing that I always find interesting is the last data point in all of these is also typically like, so depending on the cohort size, size so we're picked years. So and you can tell like, they all kind of like get bent downwards because the year is not complete. So right now, like 2020 is a partial year. So it's interesting to see that, you know, you, you expect lower. And the reason to use tighter, tighter cohorts, if you do like monthly, that yeah. happens so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, cool. Let's move on to this chart. And I have a version of two versions of this chart, uh, Jonathan. So we can now talk about both the retention and then uh, talk about it in terms of heat map as well. Yeah, so this is a cohort retention. I mean, most people here have probably seen this, right? So after two years here, apparently this product has about 20% of their customers retaining at some level. Um, once again, you want to look at shape, you want to look at level, right? I think, you know, one thing that happens in very special businesses is that um, every now and then there exists a business, there exists business where like retention goes down and then it comes up somehow, you know, mm -hmm. over time. And, there, and presumably that's because somehow late in the life of that cohort, there is something that got better. The product got better. Maybe there was a network. Yeah. New, product new product change. launch or something. Yeah. Something, right. Something happened. Yeah. And that's usually a special thing um, to, to look for. But, but by and large, yeah, this is really to understand the shape and the level of each cohort's retention. There is a, um, there is a YouTube video from Y Combinator that Alex Schultz from Facebook's growth accounting team or growth team uh, uh, shared. And it's a pretty nice lecture. And he talks about product market fit quite a bit. And this is one chart that he draws and says, I, I consider product company to have product market fit if this line plateaus out over the years. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that, that's not, not terrible. I mean, like, I guess, you know, I, you know, I think that there's this, this question about like, whether it's, you know, 
whether you can observe that on a short time frame. I think that's the problem right. is that, you know, when you're looking over a really long time frame, it's hard to know where it is. And really what you're doing is you're prognostic, you're hitting about the deep future of like some product that you may not have many years of experience with. If a product has only been out for a year, how are you going to prognosticate on your eight? You can try to prognosticate on it, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, take a look at this question that's being asked. It's, I think it's directed towards you um, on uh, what, how do you discuss these charts yeah. with your portfolio founders? What sort of CTAs usually result for the operating teams and what can we learn regarding product development? Yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of this stuff is really here as a framework to help, um, to help uh, facilitate discussion, right? You know, when I think about with our founders and when I think about operating, you know, folks who are building product day in, day out, it's good to know about this stuff so that they can think, okay, if I build this feature, they usually have some feature in mind. Um, how is it going to affect these other metrics and to have a feeling? Is this going to affect growth accounting? Is it going to affect, where is it going to show up? Because the thing is, if you build some feature and it, 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 it doesn't show up anywhere, then and you don't even you don't even think it will show up anywhere then like you know maybe that's a question about like how is the value going to represent itself in some sense you know when we talk with our portfolio companies we spend a lot of time talking about like what do you think is the core north star metric what is the unit of value that you're generating outside of money obviously and like once you have that here's a bunch of a standard framework for us to break that down into a bunch of ways okay now you want to build features where is it going to show up and so it's, it's a lot of this discussion about sort of like refining the thinking of how what you build turns into value, right? Um, you notice that what I just said there, I didn't say anything about A-B testing and that was on purpose. <laughs> you see, you might think, do you help your portfolio founders A-B test? No, I don't, right? Because like A-B testing is only is like further down the line. At the beginning, it's more like, how do you develop a concept of like, how is value being created in your product and how do you understand it? How can you measure it in many different ways? That, yeah, that makes sense. Um, there are a couple of more questions that just showed up. How do you determine the cohort grouping timeframes? Would it change with my product cycle? Well, I think about it less about the product cycle. I think about the customer life cycle, right? So like, um, you, know, you know, I guess a good rule of thumb here is that you want to make sure that you're choosing the grouping such that the graph is useful. If your, if your product has only been out for like six months and you try to use annual yeah. groupings, it's not so it's good. It's work. Yeah. Um, and by this same token, if if you're only you know acquiring two or three customers a month, then you probably shouldn't use weekly, <laughs> right? So you want to use something that makes you feel like you see it, right? Um, yeah. Monthly tends to be pretty good for the vast bulk of use cases. I think it's rare that that monthly doesn't really work well unless you really don't acquire a lot of customers. Um, but you know, I, I like monthly. Um, you can use weekly if you want. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's been interesting is as we've worked with private equity firms, uh, the ones who are doing longer term investing, they want to see like annual as well as monthly. Um, and especially for mature businesses, it may make sense where you've had the same product for a long time. You have a lot of users that you're that are going through. Um, but yeah, I think that that makes yeah. sense. This is also another example. Yeah. One, one, one other thing on this concept. This is something else that you see. So if you look, if you read public SaaS company um, like uh, like uh, 10Ks, they don't actually talk about their cohort stuff, but they will often like kind of hint at it. So if you look at Slack's public filings, they actually have some stuff from which you can deduce the annual structure of the cohorts, but only just barely. And it's really because Slack's not required to file it, right? Companies, public right. companies are not required to file anything about cohorts. So they, they, they basically say it because they think it'll make them look good, <laughs> right? Um, and they kind of just choose because there's no rules on this stuff. Um, you know, but, but despite that being the case for public um, reporting requirements internally, when you operate your business, you know, you could bet that they measure it every which way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, there's probably a whole discussion to be had is should this become a part of the requirement or not to be disclosed for co companies or not? Um, but that's a diff long discussion there. Um, how should we account for customer feedback? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just different, right? Like, I think it's useful. I, don't get me wrong, I think customer feedback is super important. One of the things about, you know, taking an analytical approach to the world is that you can measure with some level of precision and that your measurements are kind of unbiased, you know? And note that I do use the word unbiased there, you know, on purpose, you know, um, income statements are not biased, right? Um, they're not ever biased. It's just like, this is what happened. It's your interpretation could be biased of the past, right? Um, in the same way, when you generate these graphs, there's no bias. It's just like, that's what it is. Now you can decide, you can infer what you wish 
and you know how you infer you know maybe in, in, you know it, uh, introduces bias into the situation and so you know the point of all of this stuff is to do is to develop a viewpoint that has not and customer feedback is invariably going to have bias all over it, and that's not bad. But it's just a you know it's something it's something I think about as being pretty separate. Note that in our investment procedure, um, we usually do these things separately. We do the analytical work, and then you know um, assuming that we should that we decide to continue pursuing the opportunity, we will still go get that customer feedback. So I should point out that as investors, we take it we take customer feedback very seriously, but it's sort of a separate process that runs you know in parallel. I feel like there is another another parallel to m a investing. So if you look at uh, what we and we, when we've looked at and worked with private equity firms and investment banks, what they're doing today as they go through a transaction of a company, they are typically hiring an audit firm, an accounting firm to go through the income statements and the financials. And they also come up with something called an adjusted EBITDA, EBITDA number, which is a forward looking number based on like what's relevant uh, it, th that's happened in the business and why, why that should, the adjusted EBITDA should, EBITDA should, uh, should be used for the valuation purpose. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that something like that could happen in this world as well. Uh, and an example I thought of what, that was that we saw when working with a company is at some point, uh, one of the companies that we were working with had, a, re had realized that they had built one of their product offerings was just simply not not going to be, have ever have for product market fit. And they removed not only that product, but all of the customers that had purchased that product. And that didn't show, doesn't, they basically, if you go to their looker or if they go to their Tableau, they'll filter out all of those customers. And they're like, we're never, never gonna acquire them. Now, it's an interesting question because you could say, hey, look, if you're gonna build growth accounting or these charts, you should include everybody you've ever had. But their point is like, hey, the, that product was a test that failed and is not no longer relevant. So there is a point of like an adjusted version of a product market fit. I mean, it goes back to my thing about, you know, the job of, a, of an operator and the job of an investor are different, right? Like yeah. they're different. They're trying to do different things. You know, I think that when people say like adjusted EBITDA, the natural, the natural public response is to be like, oh, they're like cheating. But if anybody's ever actually looked at accounting rules, they mostly make no sense, right? Like accounting rules, they kind of, public accounting rules exist to like help the IRS collect taxes and to like help protect retail investors, right? But like the reality is that like most of what, you know, most of what happens out there is very sharp investors who should be able to dig into it as much as possible. And then frankly, the company's a counterparty, right? Where the company's trying yeah. to play itself in the best light and it's on them to figure it out. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a fan of that kind of being left left to its own devices. But once again, this is a long discussion. We can, we can go here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's keep uh, let's keep going. We have the last topic and uh, try and uh, actually do you want to quickly chat about the heat map version okay. of this? And this is, this is the same as the other let's one. Skip over. Yep. Um, all right, let's chat about this one, and I'm going to hide this for keeping it this con uh, uh, this uh, conversation simple. So. Uh, most companies, we, we were chatting about this, Jonathan, most companies probably don't even look at this, but some companies that do look at sales concentration, which is what percentage of customers is bringing in what percentage of the revenue, they're typically looking at it in one of two ways. They're either doing a, a very simple thing that we've seen is uh, what percentage of customers bring in what percentage of revenue. So 20% of customers bring in 65% of revenue in this case. They're often looking at that kind of index or they're building this like Gini type index where what you can kind of see the how um, skewed this curve is. Like if you're a very, very concentrated business where a few customers are bringing in most of the revenue, you'll see a point all the way out here. And if it's a business where most customers are bringing in almost an equal amount of revenue, you'll see a line that's a curve that's much closer to this like perfect diagonal line. Tell me about what you think about this and like what information is missing here. Sure. So high level, what we're trying to achieve here is some understanding of the distribution of the product market fit across your customer base. Okay. So I have all these customers, some of them are spending a lot, some of them are spending a little. How do I get a feel for that? Like, is it super unequal? Or is it really equal? And there are sort of many ways to do that. A natural thing to do would be to make a histogram. How many people make, you know, sort of do at each level of revenue. That's sort of the natural thing. For a bunch of reasons, when you dig into histograms, that ends up to be problematic um, that we won't get into today. This is sort of an academic approach to it um, in which you on the x-axis 
plot the percent of customers and on the y-axis the percent of value, total value that's being generated. So for example, this thing here says that you know 50% of the customers generate, uh, the bottom 50% generate something like, uh, you know, I guess something like 20 something percent. Actually, no, this is usually generated. Okay, the way, this, the, the way that this one is arranged, the power users are on the left. So yes. implicitly, implicitly, the most, the highest revenue customers are on the left on near the near the origin and the lower value ones are off to the to to large x long tail yeah and so what yep. this says here is that the most valuable 20 percent are generating 65 percent of the revenue which is sort of the point he's he's hovered over there um i'm not a fan of this graph because in fact it wasn't even so obvious even for me describing it which direction was high revenue which one was not in fact we have no clue how much revenue how much these customers spend from this graph it's totally not yep. obvious um, um, you had mentioned Genie. Genie is an example of when you plot a distribution this way, there is a single statistic you can compute off of this distribution called the Genie coefficient, which some economists like to use, but other economists think is completely useless. Um, I tend to agree with the second camp. Uh, I don't like this graph. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the one that you do like. And I actually spent quite a bit of time thinking through this chart after you had shared. I'd read your article about this and thought it was. Uh, at first, like not very intuitive, but once you like get it, it helps answer a lot of different questions. So let's walk through this one and how this helps answer those questions and what additional piece of information is this revealing? And tell me yeah. where to hover and I'll do that. Yeah, I mean, you can just hover over one one spot on the X-axis, like, yeah, that's fine, doesn't matter where. Okay, so like what this says here, that says that the blue line there um, says, wait, which one is which here? Is the blue the, blue is the- um, Blue is the customers and then- customers. Okay. So, blue is the is the, so what that point says is that 33% of customers spent less than $43 a year. And you see on the x-axis is no longer percent. The x-axis is now the dollars itself. That's much, that's really useful. Okay. 33% of them spent less than $43 a year. And if you go straight down above the 33%, um, you'll see that those customers who spent $43 spent a generated a total of 9% of the revenue. Okay. So, so what this is saying is that the bottom 30% generated 9% of the revenue. Okay, so the full distribution is actually in here, but um, but it's uh, but you can see the dollar amount, right? Um, note that the so the the blue line is the is basically the cumulative distribution function of customers. The purple line is the cumulative distribution function of, of the dollars itself. Um, the purple line is always below the blue line by definition. The reason why is because the revenue is always going to be further out in the distribution because the more the customers who spend more are by definition over there. And they, by definition, contribute more to the distribution, which is why the, blue, the purple line is underneath there. Um, that's a little esoteric. If you wish, you can read my blog to read the extreme detail there. <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend reading that blog. So in this particular one, if you want to go, yeah, if you want to, you want to hover over the eighty percent, um, around two hundred dollars, maybe. Um, yeah. No, no. Uh, blue line. All the ways. Oh, you want to do this with the blue line at eighty percent? Okay, there. So there. Yeah. So the top twenty percent spend. Spend okay. The bottom eighty percent spend less than one hundred fifty dollars, which means the top twenty percent spend more than one hundred fifty dollars by definition, right? And so the top twenty percent spend one hundred fifty dollars, and if you go straight down, you'll see one hundred fifty dollars. They generate half. So eighty twenty for this business is fifty twenty, right? The top twenty percent are generating fifty percent of the revenue. It is less yeah. concentrated than eighty twenty. Eighty twenty is kind of the thing that people usually say. Most things on the internet are not eighty twenty. That's sort of a weird phenomenon. Um, that's worth discussing at some point if somebody really wants to know. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, this very quickly, you can get a sense of what that is and that it's specifically $150 is the price point. That's the break point for the top 80%. Yeah. Yeah, I love the fact that it, uh, it, it, it surfaces that data point of like where it actually, what dollar amount it shows up. One last question about this and then I'll answer one of the questions. Then we can go to the questions from the audience. So if you're thinking, if you think about an example company, you're thinking about early early stage investment. They're seeing a lot of growth. Let's say they've seen some astronomical astronomical amount of growth in the more recent days. Is this chart going to bias for looking at the revenue uh, because those customers haven't? So the recent customers mm -hmm. that the business has acquired hasn't. Those customers haven't had the chance to spend the revenue that they would over their lifetime. How do you account for that? Yeah, we, it's true. What you're saying is true, that invariably you're looking at this at a snapshot, like in one month or something. Um, and those customers could be of different vintages. 
Um, and usually we don't bother accounting for that. You can correct for that in various ways by sort of adjusting. Um, we usually don't, don't bother with that um, just because this is, this is insightful enough on its own. But you know, one could do that. Okay. Yep. Got it. All right, cool. Um, all right, there are three questions here and maybe we'll go from the bottom to top. Uh, let's go with, what are your top three metrics for determining whether a company has product market fit? What do you look for uh, to determine whether product market fit is flat, uh, flat uh, faltering? And how do you know when a company has lost product market fit? Yeah, so we don't look at any three metrics. I think we think of these things as three analytical frameworks, right? And we apply the frameworks and the frameworks generate a bunch of, you know, graphs, a bunch of numbers. And we look at that full set, you know? When I think about having product market fit, clearly you want something that's growing, that has good lifetime dynamics somehow, and has some reasonable distribution. That's usually what I think of very loosely, but as you can tell, it's very loose because it's not, because it tends to be very dependent on what the situation is. Or rather, right. just because you have product market fit may, doesn't mean it's interesting, right? As I described with my intellectual sort of exercise of the box that just spits out dollars, yeah, that has product market fit, but that might not be interesting, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, not profitable. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, this? This is a good good question, and we've gotten this. So when we did this type of analysis for companies, they're like, "This is great, but what are what what is this actionable? What actions can I, or insights can I take, especially for investment due diligence or operating a company?" Yeah. So for us as investors, we tend to, as I mentioned before, we use this to just get an understanding of what's going on, just like an investor would look at an income statement, right? An investor would look at an income statement primarily just to be like, "What's going on? Where is everything going?" and then maybe compute some ratios so they can develop the story in their head. And that's the same way we, we, we compute all this stuff so that we can very quickly get a feel for what's going on in an extremely precise way, right? The point is precision and speed that we can get to. So that's, that's the main thing we do there. When we present this stuff to founders, right? Um, as you mentioned, sort of how does this help with, uh, you know, when you give it back to companies, really when we give it back to founders, a lot of the time the value that we're showing them is that you can use these approaches, one, that these approaches exist, two, that you can use them on quantities that they may not have thought of. So it's pretty common for us to talk to a founder and they'll, and we'll, we'll do this type of work on their revenue data, but maybe we'll do it on some other data. Like maybe it's messages sent or logins or like, I don't know, like, you know, number of API calls by customer or something like that. Um, and it'll be some other metric, but we'll treat it the same way and we'll present it back to them. Usually founders at that point are like, oh, I didn't think about measuring it that way. And then once they start thinking about it, they realize there's a bunch of other things that they could conceivably compute and that it would just give them a new lens through which to see their business. And, and that's what leads to the actionability, right? So like, you know, we don't aim to be actionable per se. It's more like, let's change the way you think about this. And that will buy, as a byproduct, generate actionable insights, right? Um, sort of naturally. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, last question I think is, uh around where can I found, find more resources and apply these. I think uh, that I've pulled up a slide. So I really like the essays that uh, have been posted on Tribe Capital's uh, website and I've shared a link here. And then also Retina, uh, we, we have a couple of like places where we've done this and uh, there's retina.ai slash academy and also our quality of customer report tool. So. We've applied it for if somebody has first party data, you can get to this very easily within a matter of 24 hours. If you want to do it on your own, I, I really recommend you look at Jonathan's essays and especially this product market fit article that um, I consume out here is really good. And at the end, it, I think there are links to actual code on how you can implement some of these graphs uh, using, I think PostgreSQL, is that right, uh, Jonathan? Yeah. That's what, that's, that's what that information is. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Sources wise, right. um, it's a good question. I don't know of any great ones. Um, you know, I think that it's an interesting thing. If you were to ask me, what are the great sources for accounting? I would point you to some sort of textbook, right? Because people have written textbooks on accounting. Um, you know, when we're dealing with this world of like modern analytics, where we are right now, as I mentioned, analytics is really only, modern analytics in some sense is only about 15 years old now, right? Because we had to have all the data. Until we had all the data, there was no analytics to do, right? Now we have all this data and there's folks trying all sorts of different things. And to be frank, I don't think anybody's really written a great book on it because it's kind of too early, right? It's not really an academic science yet. I mean, there are folks, some folks who are doing some stuff on the academic side. 
Um, but really this sort of question about building product, how do you build better products? How do you, you know, satisfy customers with product? And then how do you measure it? That sort of, uh, you know, sort of cloud of ideas is not something that's really that, that you know, there is any one great source for, I think. So, um, you know, I, I unfortunately don't have any great recommendations, but if you find any, please, please send them over to me. I'd be interested. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like though, as, as you mentioned, like I really like a lot of the work that um, is being done uh, here several companies it's i feel like are doing it they're not just a lot of it's just not getting shared yet and then i do like a lot of the work that uh dan mccarthy and their team are doing they're they're extending it beyond beyond this concept but uh one topic that we touched on which is like in a making trying to push on public companies to share a lot of this data they're working on that and there's some really uh, interesting like conversations there that i've had with dan on that um, all right, with that, I know we're a little bit over, quite a bit over time, actually. We're a little bit, 15 minutes over time, but I hope that this was helpful. Um, thank you for, uh, to everyone who attended and also for participating and asking some engaging questions. And lastly, Jonathan, thank you so much. This was really fun. I really, I mean, it's not often that I get to nerd out uh, on, on charts and graphs, and I really enjoyed that. And thank you for putting this framework together and taking the time to join us and share That's your fun. ideas. Absolutely. Thanks for having me and feel free to hit me on LinkedIn. If any of you have questions, you know, I'm always around to be a resource. All right. All right. Thanks everyone.